What's up guys, it's been a while and I decided to start a completely new series. Of course, I'm gonna finish all those that I started already. So I wanna teach you how to play against Sicilians, but the main ones. That's a pretty big, conceptually uh, pretty big project because I have to explain you more than 20 different variations, such as how to play against Nidorf, how to play against Browser, against Dragon, uh, against uh, Lasker variation, Taimanov, and so many other Sicilian lines. Uh, definitely, I'd like to begin this one uh, with e4, c5, uh, knight f3, and e6, so-called O'Kelly variation. O'Kelly variation happens after e4, c5, knight f3, and a6. First, I have to tell you that lately it became very popular because a couple of courses on Chessable, uh, you know, like were uh, published. And one of the main points of a6 is uh, simply to wait for you to play just like you treat the Sicilian in a classic fashion. What does it mean? It means if you go in this position with the most logical d4, which is initially your idea when you play first move knight f3, they're just going to take. And when you play knight, knight e4, they go knight f6. Don't forget, you can't play e5 because of queen a5 check. That's uh, one very important trick to remember. And when you play knight c3, boom, they just go e5. They kick your knight away. And now your knight cannot go on b5, which means that you gotta either retreat on b3 or f3. Well, on f5, they're just going to break in the center. Once again, breaking in the center with d5, undermining your knight, center on e4, and basically, I believe that black is already doing fine. That's why I was just thinking, what should I uh, show you and how should I teach you to play these positions? And that's why uh, I gave the title here, how to beat up O'Kelly variation at the same time as how to play with an IQP and how to learn to attack and how to play those positions better simultaneously with uh, learning this variation. So what does it mean? After like e4, c5, knight f3, a6, I opted for c3. c3 is called Venice system. Uh, and the main idea of c3 is of course to go with d4 and to build up a pretty strong center afterwards. Here I'm gonna show you like it's a, it's going to be a little bit different in comparison to all our lectures in the past. I'm gonna show you like a couple of games and I'm gonna show you like uh, practical uh, you're gonna have more like practical guide how to play this one. So you just have to remember that C3 is one of the most critical systems. And I remember when I spoke to Grandmaster Marianovic, uh, my, uh, one of my first coaches, he told me, you should be going with C3 to treat this like the Alapin, where the pawn on A6 turns out to be stupid. And that is something that I want to tell you here as well. So we, we should be going with C3. Our main idea is to play D4, to build up a strong center. But at the same time, if they play d5 and what else are they going to do you're just going to play like an improved version of the alapin system what does it mean it means that this is especially good for those who are familiar with this alapin sicilian variations who are familiar with the uh, isolated queen pawn type of the games and for those who like to attack so that's me uh, most of you guys like to attack you keep asking me to show you like some interesting systems so there we go i also want to tell you one more thing that in one of one of the last serious attempts by black to apply O'Kelly variation was uh, between Caruana and Rajabov. Caruana played c4 in the candidates tournament last year he won that game uh, but that's not my approach. But of course, whoever likes Marazzi bind type of structures, you should be going for a C4. Once again, those who do a Kelly don't go with D4. So after a C3, you just want to go with D4 and to build up a strong center. They gotta go D5. Makes no sense to play E6 because you play D4. Simply, if they take, you will recapture and get a strong center. When they play D5, now you play an improved version 
of the French advanced where once again a6 turns out to be kind of useless we just go with the knight on c3 we just go with the bishop on d3 and sometimes we go short castle sometimes h4 sometimes but a3 before followed by rook c1 knight a4 in general uh white is just doing uh, a lot better in this type of games also if they go for a typical alapin with knight f6 you shouldn't be afraid of these type of games as well you just go with e5 and after knight e5 you just go with d4 once again we have a pretty typical and pretty easy type of the game where you choose either to take by pawn and to play a position like this where a6 turns out to be stupid because in all those elephant positions a6 simply doesn't exist or you can even choose uh, in this situation if they take on d4 to go with bishop c4 and to get a good game uh, i apologize not bishop b5 but bishop goes to c4 uh, that's not my approach i would just tell you to take on d4 by pawn and to get a good game so uh, basically uh, but whether you play one or another a6 turns out to be absolutely pointless by black that's it and that's where we actually have to check d5 move by black almost everyone who plays a Kelly variation after a c3 they will be going with d5 also I checked all those courses in order to show you what's happening there and I just made sure that when they play d5 you should be going with uh, of course uh, it takes d I mean that most of these guys after a c3 they gave d5 for black so after he takes queen takes d4 they just have to go with knight f6 and you play bishop to e3 I would like to emphasize the importance of the bishop e3 move and why is it so important because you over protect the pawn on d4 and you now threaten to take on c5 when you play bishop e3 they simply can't sit and wait because you're just going to capture on c5 and remain up a pawn that actually forces your opponent to take on d4 and when they take on d4 we're taking by pawn believe it or not and in normal circumstances i would say probably d4 is kind of weak isolated pawn but since we're talking about the iqp type of games where it really works uh, perfectly fine for white and i just have to share my secret with you i enjoy these positions with white pieces and i won most of my games here you're just about to learn how to attack and what should be the setup with an iqp type of the game also by taking by pawn you've just opened up the c3 square for your knight and to harass that queen on d d5 with tempo they go e6 and you play knight to c3 uh, a very a logical move you just go with tempo i want to uh, show you here a few different approaches that queen goes on d6 in normal uh, circumstances but what happens if they just go with the bishop before that move doesn't make much sense because uh, black doesn't want to give up the bishop for the knight and he will have to if he goes for eighth move bishop before you just go with bishop d3 remember your light square bishop goes on d3 why because we would like to attack why because we got a iqp why because you're not supposed to exchange pieces because you're not supposed to sit and wait you gotta attack so after bishop d3 castles and when castles happen we also go for short castle here as well so right now queen on d5 is hanging so they just have to take it and simply they will have, i mean uh, i just want to teach you how to react in different kind of you know like systems by black so here we're just checking what happens if they give up the dark square bishop if they give up the bishop pair how should you play I very much like uh, Dusko Pavasovic uh, strong GM from Slovenia who has an amazing results with Sicilian Alapin variations and who had such a great analysis and great uh, feeling to attack on the king side especially with IQP and hanging pawns in one of his, his games was b5 he played a4 undermining these pawns on b5 and a6 bishop b7 and played queen b1 great move uh, he's just created a battery on d3 uh, and b1 
he's attacking the pawn on b5 but more importantly he's making some sort of pressure against the h7 pawn as well after b takes a4 because he's just threatening to win the pawn uh, without compensation for black they have to take on a4 and Palasovic came up with something very nice here you know that the hanging pawns are only good if they stand like c4 and d4 and you know that you enjoy here all together with a strong hanging pawns in the center also uh, the advantage of the bishop pair but what do you have to do you gotta open up the game so this is why white goes with d5 breaking everything he's actually uh, opening up the game for his bishops and getting a great activity after e takes c takes here black just has to go with the queen d5 and boom rook captures on a4 it is getting ready and all systems are ready for the mating attack on the king side a wife would like to reposition his rook onto the h4 and to go with the attack very lovely one and Pavlasovic went on to win this game We've just seen how to treat if they give up the bishop pair and the bishop on c3 and instead of forcing you to play with an iqp uh, your opponent forces you to play with a hanging pawns another possibility in these positions could be what happens if the queen goes on a5 queen on a5 is not entirely good piece in this type of games and development of your pieces should not be too different you just go with bishop d3 knight c6 uh, a3 to avoid any knight before because any a3 is just avoiding knight before and you're not avoiding bishop before we can also say that you also avoid the bishop before but you're avoiding knight before knight bd5 why because black is always more than happy uh, to get a blockade on d5 by knight because the knight is the best blocking piece in chess and that's how black should be trading these positions to block with the best blocking piece it's knight so block the iqp and keep on trading off pieces so the more pieces you exchange the easier game black should have uh, against the iqp so after bishop e7 castles castles queen goes on e2 i very much insist on the queen on e2 in these positions my queen uh, first of all I, i've just opened up the back rank for my rooks second thing uh, i'm just preparing myself for some sort of attack with uh, of course controlling and attacking the e6 controlling e5 in some moments you'll see that this queen has like a great possibilities to go onto the king side after rook to d8 rook a d1 b5 for example those who play a6 and the Kali players they just played a6 they gotta go with b5 sooner or later otherwise why did they play a6 what kind of you know like uh advantages are they going to get by having that move e a6 being played so they just go with this and when that happens all you have to do is bring the bishop back to b1 that's such an important move in these positions so all together with placing your rooks on from a1 to d1 with queen on e2 another rook goes from f1 to e1 you always put the bishop back on b1 what's the point of bringing the bishop back to b1 he is setting himself ready for either queen d3 or queen c2 which is a famous battery with an iqp but also uh, you're over protecting d4 since bishop is not anymore on d3 so rook on d1 is controlling d4 and more importantly you would like once they play g6 to remove the light square bishop on a2 and to support the d5 typical iqp type of breaks when they go before captures captures as soon as you can you should jump with the knight on e5 knight on e5 creates a possible danger uh, on the f7 square knight on e5 is in the center they can't go to d5 because of knight c6 they gotta waste one more tempo but it's a good one because they also carry on developing their pieces and you play bishop g5 i believe that most of you cannot even fill at the moment that we're about to win this game on the spot believe it or not white is threatening 
bishop takes f6 followed by bishop h7 followed by queen h5 queen f7 with a winning game for white that's why they have to go with the knight bd5 and here my job as your coach has to be and to teach you how to carry on and how to attack with an iqp so here you have a typical rook lifting which is one of the main ideas first of all you overprotect the knight on c3 and second thing all together with the bishops on g5 and b1 you also want to place that rook on g3 or h3 and to go with a very pretty much straightforward attack on the king's side also would it be a mistake if you played a thin move rook after you want not and here i'd like to connect this position and by the way you're threatening knight takes f7 followed by queen e6 to win on the spot so just like you see iqp type of games give you lots of tactics i'd like to connect this with nimzovich uh, father of positional play with his famous book my system in practice where at some point in his book he said if you play with an iqp always try to place your rooks on d1 and d1 because that, those are natural squares and the most aggressive and attacking you know like uh, positions for your rooks if you'd like to go with the attack once again you're not threatening knight f7 followed by queen e6 in this position by bringing the rook onto the third rank here threatening rook h3 or rook g3 and white in both of these variations has like an amazing position there are so many players who bring the queen back to d8 does it change anything uh, in our game not so we play bishop d3 why because we're interested in pointing out the king's side especially h7 pawn at some point any knight c6 i insist on this one they're threatening knight before not because they only uh, want to take your light square bishop but they was also like to bring the knight back to d5 and get a great a blockade against the iqp that actually means that we have to play a3 and to prevent knight before for the time being they go bishop e7 you go castles castles and how do we develop ourselves in the most typical fashion queen goes on e2 at the moment we've just opened up the back rank i once again would like to remind you of the nimzovich words rook goes to d1 rook from f1 goes to e1 and that's how you want to attack after b5 rook a d1 bishop e7 rook f2 uh, e1 and rook c8 we have everything we've just developed all our pieces and in order to be able to carry on successful in these positions you gotta know how to play and what to do so what do you have to do first bring the bishop back to b1 you over protect the pawn on d4 you wanna go for the battery queen d3 or queen c2 you over uh, protect not only pawn on d4 but also create some breaks with d5 and also a very important possibility is going with the bishop on a2 and supporting some type of ideas connected with d5 so after like bishop to b1 uh, for example your opponent in situation like this can always go for some knight a5 or b4 uh, an important thing is if they go uh, for b4 it shouldn't scare you at all so let's say they go with b4 uh, you don't have to take because you say oh i'm about to lose the pawn on a3 who cares about a pawn we care about the mating attack so 94 uh 94 bishop before by removing the knight around the king our chances of going for the king side attack and breaking in the center with d5 they're highly highly increased b takes b takes and i just want to tell you one thing we're about to break with d5 which is going to give you a great uh, centralization you're going to take advantage of the rook on d1 but more importantly they can't take on a3 which usually should be one of our biggest fears and that's why i told you don't even feel threatened when they play before that you have to take because they can never take this pawn on a3 you just go with bishop h7 king h7 and ig5 catching them in some sort of uh how do we call this great gift so if they go with the queen, king g6 queen g4 wins if king g8 queen h5 wins and they can't stop 
uh, mate on h7 or they're just falling apart in the next couple of moves in case of bishop b1 and knight a5 because they just open up the bishop on b7 they would like to jump with this knight on c4 you know what we brought a bishop back to b1 but now dark square bishop has to find its role as well so we play bishop g5 we've just opened up our pieces and now increased our chances of breaking in the center with d5 so when they go with h6 a beautiful 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 break is d5 now you can have fun analyzing these positions um you know like at home uh, what happens if h takes g5 i'm just gonna give you a line that simply uh caught my attention the most it was e takes d5 because i just wanted to uh analyze e takes d5 and to see the real problems um, of this move and here what has an amazing tactical possibility it's believe it or not bishop h6 bishop h6 uh, so after g takes h6 a beautiful queen d2 move uh, usually we forget about these calm moves and it's very important to remember that the d4 was more like clearing than anything else so after king g7 da -da -da -da, knight comes to d4 he threatens knight f5 queen h6 and white is winning that means and that said queen d6 remains at absolutely the best possibility you go with the bishop d3 as usual knight c6 and as soon as you see knight c6 you just go with a3 in these positions when they go with bishop e7 you go for castles they go for castles does it change anything in our position no we play queen e2 as usual we open up the back rank connect our rooks and go with the rooks on d1 and d1 when they play b5 we just go with rook a to d1 i'd like to once again remind you we always go in these positions with rooks on d1 and e1 our queen goes on e2 pawn comes on a3 to prevent knight before knight bd5 uh, rook comes from f1 to e1 and your light square bishop usually goes back to b1 uh, especially because after g6 it would like to change its return a2 uh, ga diagonal and to break and to support d5 but also the dark square bishop goes on g5 any b4 you're not afraid because you just jump on e4 by removing the knight uh, from the king side they just have like less attack uh, defenders defensive resources so after bishop b7 rook f to e1 and here i chose like just two games to show you how typically we should attack these guys for example uh, i chose uh rook f to d8 one of the most logical moves by rook to place it there but i insist when you play that one you just weaken the f7 square so after bishop b1 we know why do we actually go back because we would like to uh, go for some battery and to go for some d5 breaks knight comes on e5 that knight that came on e5 now control c4 and now possibly goes after f7 and h7 pawns after rook a c8 bishop f4 you're just opening up that bishop and you now threaten knight f7 to win on the spot queen b6 and i can just uh, puzzle you here and give you like find the move for white a beautiful move such a typical move in these positions and it's always nice to remind yourself of move of the similar uh, strengths so d5 why do you play d5 what's so special about d5 if they play it takes d5 you all of a sudden have bishop f5 and you have knight f7 bishop e6 you threaten that rook you have all these threats don't forget you're not only threatening the rook but also this one is hanging since you have queen on e2 and rook on e1 they're lost if bishop takes d5 because lots of guys think that that could solve the, their problems you have typical bishop h7 king h7 queen h5 this one and you just go with the attack but at the same time you have queen h5 tactics and when they go for g6 sec piece sec another piece and after knight f6 because lots of guys in blitz games think that it's enough to defend their positions sorry buddy but you're not gonna be able to defend yourself bishop h7 knight h7 queen g6 and bishop e5 then 
you're gonna be down only a piece for two pawns but you just involve your rook on the third rank and mate the king that's how it works when you play and break with d5 those who take by knight don't forget bishop h7 queen h5 this one and i had a couple of uh, games like this I especially like ideas such as bishop h6 you you threaten mate on g7 you can't take by king because of queen g6 and if you just go with bishop f6 bishop takes g7 bishop g7 and knight e4 knight joins into the attack and you're about to mate the king on h7 then another possibility could be rook a c8 which could be very much connected with a previous one rook f to d8 because it can't transpose into that one a very interesting idea could be knight g5 but i don't want to you know like mix the things up and to confuse you now you always go with the bishop g5 and when they play for example knight a5 as soon as they do that they just open up the bishop they just want to pressure the knight uh, and they just at the same time would like to jump with the knight on c4 you gotta be spot on it's either knight e5 or even more beautiful d5 fantastic move you're just opening up the rook it is especially turns turns out to be uh, good enough when the bishop is on e7 and queen on d file so uh, this guy this game was played in belgium 2002 rook takes c3 captured by pawn b takes c3 and after bishop d5 because he here he sacrificed an exchange in order to create some sort of let's say unbreakable or hardly breakable position you of course don't fall for that you just go for a4 and now you just continue to play your game being up in exchange and this guy won bears uh beat boydman uh, that game was played approximately 20 years ago and finally one of the most typical things is we have the queen on e2 and the rook on e1 we have ideas of d5 they know that they might be having problems with the bishop on e7 and they play rook f to e8 does it change anything in our plans no people we just go with bishop e1 and we'd like to open up the rook and support the d4 go with bishop a2 if needed and we just can go with the battery if needed after rook a to d8 bishop g5 i'd like to once again remind you of the fact if they ever lose this one you should instantly think of knight e5 which gives you bishop f6 bishop f6 bishop h7 followed by queen h5 also stops knight c4 or some d5 ideas but you always have to calculate over the board and during the games if they go for g6 as soon as they play g6 they now have hardly breakable pawn structure your bishop becomes terribly bad and you just immediately change the path and the destination of its activity and uh, you know like uh, its uh, strength it's the a to ga diagonal so look at this game he now realized that the threat could be d5 and this guy played solidifying king g7 white jumped on e5 uh, very nice idea because you cannot take because of fork if they play knight d4 he would have gone with queen e3 threatening knight f7 or bishop h6 and that's why black played b4 grandmaster boris itkis here went for nice tactical resource bishop h6 you cannot take it because of knight f7 and it's a fork uh, but in case of king g8 uh, which was almost the only move and of course uh, it was forcing one boris itkis in 20 moves was completely winning he came up with one of the most typical tactical tricks in iqp type of games so when he went for knight takes f7 now king cannot take on f7 because of a beautiful mating net so you just go with queen e6 queen e6 and bishop e6 da -da -da -da. checkmate don't forget about this one it's such a common thing in these positions his opponent went for knight e4 it is sacrificed an exchange and uh, of course uh, queen couldn't take because of some even knight e8 or queen e6 ideas after queen c6 he threatened mate it is for example had a disposition immediately to finish him off with a beautiful knight e5 
uh, he played rook to g4 removing from the file defending mate on g2 and after this rook d4 played knight e5 he was now just simplifying the game bishop g5 took on e6 and this guy couldn't defend himself and resigned hope that you enjoyed in the presentation of how to treat okelly defense and for all of you who enjoy in this elephant type of games this was i believe a good reminder how to attack uh, with an iqp thanks for watching and see you next time i'm gonna teach you how to play e4 c5 knight f3 knight f6 so-called nimzovich variation bye bye